Vidhananji, now you can bring the topic. Yes. Good evening and uh, namaskar to everyone. I hope nobody is under any pressure at this moment, even as you are getting ready to listen to and then later discuss this topic. But at the beginning, I must tell you how this topic came to my mind. A few days ago, I watched a short five minutes video where the famous cricketer of the 80s, Kapil Dev, was speaking and he also spoke somewhat humorously, though there was a serious message over there. That's, for, that's how I have brought it up here. Kapil Dev started saying, that these days when I meet cricketers or other sportsmen or other people in various fields of life, everybody says, oh, nowadays we are under a lot of pressure, lot of pressure to perform, lot of pressure to prove ourselves. We are under pressure from outside, from our family members, and we are under pressure from our own goals, ambitions. So they are under pressure. And Kapil Dev says, I don't understand why people have to be under pressure. At our time, like all of us old people begin sentences like that, right? At our time. So Kapil Dev pretty much belongs to the age group of most of us here, says, at our time, nobody was under pressure. I did not walk to the... Uh, playing field under any pressure. Swinging my bat, I walked to the, uh, you know, the playing, uh, what do you call it, the strip. I walked to where I had to play with great enthusiasm, joy in my heart. Okay, let's play now. And so on. Maybe he exaggerated a little bit, but there was a wonderful truth in it. The great performers, not just in, uh, in the sense of how society uh, admires or adores them, that topic I will come back to. By performance, we don't mean simply doing more and more at uh, you know, greater speed and so on. Uh, Krishnamurti has talked uh, about creativity for that matter in a totally different way than how most people think about creativity. I'll connect it to this topic a bit later. But um, what Kapil Dev said, I used to walk to the field with a lot of joy in my heart without feeling any pressure, makes you and me think, where does pressure originate? And I tell you, I didn't search for an appropriate saying or quote from Krishnaji. By sheer coincidence, that day itself, I came across a quote by Krishnaji. Pressure exists on the brain when there is no space. Just a single sentence. Apparently, he had said this in Talk 6 in Madras, which is Chennai today, 8th January 1978. I said... What is this? On one hand, Kapil Dev talks about pressure. And here, the lofty thinker who had extraordinary insights into human life also talks about living under pressure and says, there is pressure on the brain when there is no space. So I reflected a little on that and a little. Then I forgot because I had various pressures on me. I got distracted. But this evening I am here in front of you to continue my own reflection on this very interesting statement. When there is no space in the brain, we experience pressure. And it's, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, Kapil Dev, to make a reference to his name one last time, put pressure in contrast with pleasure. 
Of course, he uses the word pleasure in the sense of a certain joy, certain happiness. It's my pleasure to play. It's my pleasure to drive. It's my pleasure to take this work, take this project. It's my pleasure to accept this challenge. Suppose we say, then pleasure is not pursuit of sense pleasure over there. It is a certain enthusiasm, feeling good about giving uh, or getting the opportunity to do something. All right. So there is pressure and then there is pleasure. There is joy in work. And then there is this matter called space or absence of it in our brain. Now, my two cents to share with you in this matter is as follows. This brain of ours loses its space. We don't have enough free room, enough space to move about. We feel a sort of congestion in our brain when competition, comparison and all other kinds of influences, even ideals. I must be that. And where am I? I am so far away from where I should have been. Such thoughts come. Then we move away, terribly we move away from observing or being aware of what is. Being away from what is makes us get into a big mess of what I should have been, what I should not have done. And now with very less time left on my hands, what I might be able to do, better I do it, and so on. Other day, a gentleman said to me, every time he sees his 15-year-old daughter go to high school, I believe this father feels certain disturbing, you know, emotions. He has certain disturbing thoughts. I said to him, what disturbs you when you are... The 15-year-old daughter almost dances towards the bus, gets into it and goes to her school. You must also be happy. Your heart should dance when she dances her way to the uh, bus. No, she doesn't know. She doesn't know anything. I, as her father, think about her future. She doesn't seem to pay enough attention to her studies. She is... Wasting her time in playing, in simply sitting with other girls and talking about all sorts of things. I am very concerned. I was listening. Then I said, and so what else? He said, my neighbor's daughter, you must see. Morning 5 a.m., the light in her uh, room is on. She studies couple of hours before leaving for school and evening also she studies. Look at my neighbor's daughter and look at my daughter. See, comparison. I tell you this world which you and I only have created is so wretched at times. They don't leave even swamis or sadhus or buddhist lamas or christian padris or those who have apparently Renounce this world, apparently. It's not so easy to renounce by changing some colored clothes or changing one's name or holding some staff in hand or occupying some chair in the church or in the ashram, etc. But in a manner of saying, even people who have apparently stepped aside from the mad rat race of this society are not spared by this society. They meet a Christian father and ask, how many attend your Sunday sermons? And if the father says, not many, 20 or 25. People in this, I call it wretched society, immediately say to that father, father, that's very bad. You must get at least a hundred on Sunday morning. Swamis, lamas, and in Judaism, you have rabbis, whoever. 
they ask us how many books have you written swamiji and has it been selling well and if i say i wrote a few books and i give them generally as compliments to people and then even when given as a compliment they forget to carry it with them they leave it here and go then people look at me and oh poor thing and so on that creates pressure but now the most important question is just because somebody asks you how popular or not popular you are just because somebody asks you whether your books are selling well or not selling at all just because they behave like that do you have to be under pressure the answer is absolutely no if we have intelligence if we know how to separate the grain from the chaff we can listen to what they say and instantly realize ah no wonder great thinkers like j krishnamurthy have talked about this this evil called comparison this uncle of mine is comparing me with another swami or lama or you know rabbi or somebody whose books are selling well who comes on radio or television who is featured in media etc the comparison and this comparison doesn't hold water it is meaningless you know the brain has no space when we allow all kinds of such ideas i should be famous i should be popular i should be rich i should be traveling to different countries i should be well received and so on and so forth family people those who don't have family single women single men in countless ways come under pressure and it's not because the world is a mad mad world it is because these people give in they give in to those suggestions somebody suggests somebody says to a woman who perhaps uh, is a divorcee oh you live single oh oh that is unfortunate sorry to know what is there so sad to know you mean married people are happy women who have a husband are happy many a time they are actually not at all at peace there are many women for whom the husband is a constant bothration and i have no gender bias there are many men who might take their wives to a party and both of them standing with a soft drink and what not showing to the society as though they are doing wonderfully but back home they may be fighting and sometimes it is the husband who is constantly nagged by the wife so what business do people have to express sympathy to somebody who doesn't have a partner those who have partners many times are more unhappy than others so this pressure on the brain is when we give in or there is another expression we buy into somebody says haven't you seen <clears throat> eiffel tower in paris unless you see the eiffel tower in paris at least once in life i tell you your life is waste let her or let him say anything why do i have to buy into that opinion you by smile at him you can but by simply deciding okay next time somebody pokes me saying have you seen eiffel tower have you gone to australia have you been okay leave it all in india itself have you gone to the northeast assam meghalaya you haven't oh i sympathize with you somebody pokes at us then do we have to buy into it we can listen to them with chest up therefore in order to create space in the brain in order to be free from pressure in order to live more in what kapil dev called pleasure 
but that's not a very appropriate word in the literature that you and I study generally. The word would be happiness, peace, joy, serenity, a certain broad-mindedness, certain light-heartedness. So, in contrast to living under pressure, can we live in certain light-heartedness? But this is serious business also at the same time. Why calling it light-heartedness? In no way I mean being too casual, irresponsible, careless, not doing uh, work that comes to us. That's where the whole challenge is. You and I should not fall for all kinds of opinions that the society throws at us, judging us, judging themselves, judging some third party and making comments. We should not fall for those opinions. But at the same time, this does not mean we should go lazy. We should put our legs up and watch television saying, I don't want to become famous. I, you know, have let go of all ambition. I have no desire to become somebody. Saying all that, you have actually ended up just, um, that's called uh, laid back. You have become laid back. You go on eating something, munching something, tea after tea, coffee after coffee, etc. That is no different, if not uh, worse than you know, being in the rat race. So the tightrope walk is neither to fall for the so-called rat race, which creates one kind of pressure in our brain, nor to become a slave to sense pleasure, saying, I'm not ambitious. All I need is some good food and good drink and, you know, and so on. This is a very challenging thing. Now coming to what I earlier said, a connection with creativity. I must share with you my own experience. Years ago in Naimisham, that is a beautiful J. Krishnamurti Center, not affiliated to Krishnamurti Foundation India, it's independent, but uh, they are also trying to do the same work as KFI does. I lived in that campus for some time, a few months, etc. Over there, somebody who many of you know well, Kishore Kainar came. He was conducting a two or three days workshop. I was present, I joined. And the topic was creativity. I'll show the connection and then pause or stop. Kishore Kainar went on opening the topic of this creativity. And something I learned that day, I learned something which I had never thought about. Of course, he quoted from Krishnaji and put uh, a little bit of light from his side also. He said, generally, creativity is taken as implying uh, when Thomas Edison or one of those scientists or in any field, in economics or in mathematics, in various subjects, people discover something which nobody else knew. You know? And the world stands up and applauds. Oh, you found this out. So creativity is connected with something glamorous, something much appreciated, especially if it has monetization possible. Everything finally is translated into another new industry where the business turns, the turnover goes into millions and billions of dollars. So much the better. They will say, this scientist found this out. And today... His discovery or her discovery has led to such a big industry, you see, all that. Kishore Kairnar made it very clear, that is not true creativity. And then he took it to the depth of self-inquiry. He said, true creativity is to see the falsity of, these are my words, he expressed in some, some way of his own, but it boiled down to this. When you are not mechanical, when you are not like blind sheep, just following other sheep, when you are not chasing fame and name, when you are not uh, excited about uh, some prospect of finding out something and thereby, you know, perhaps you will become very well known in the town. Without any such motives, when you, number one, 
explore something with no motive, with no thought of uh, you know reward. And number two, on the self-inquiry level, this was said. True creativity is to see, hey, I am behaving so mechanically. I am going by my old habits or I have picked up the habits of people around me. In this process, I have lost my originality. One sees it and one sees it and one that seeing itself puts an end to that kind of mechanical behavior. Then one doesn't have to discover something which the world never knew, but that discovering that this was a mechanical process and I have let go of it. And then you relax, you experience certain lightness and then you do whatever you do. It doesn't have to have a market value. You find something, you sitting in a jungle maybe, you listen to the song of a bird and you are delighted. Wow, this bird is singing and I like it. This music, the bird's voice really uplifts me. Ah, that is creativity. So likewise, coming back now to pressure, pleasure, pressure, pleasure and <coughs> space in the brain. Friends, my two cents, I would like to end in this way. All of us, no matter what our background is, what our social status is, no matter how people look at us as good or bad, you know, great super people or insignificant common people, these are all unimportant. If you and I can rediscover certain originality in us, what is it that our heart wants? What is it that we truly aspire for? Not at the thought level, not at the conditioned thought level. Deeply inside, we have a certain, we are by nature. All of us are not the same in, by nature. Somebody, you know, is fast, somebody is slow. Somebody loves poetry, somebody loves prose. Somebody likes sports, somebody likes some arts. Somebody like me has certain love. I don't know how much, but certain amount of love for language. Yeah. Sanskrit, English, Kannada, Hindi. All these four languages I keep sometimes wondering what, what the exact meaning of this or that word is and so on. Today, uh, I say that I end my talk. Today, in a certain meeting, there that um, Marathi word came up. Vahivat. <laughs> so I said in Kannada, Vahivat means some general transaction. Then another member in the meeting said, oh, that is true, Vahivat can mean general transaction, but Vahivat also means with regard to a path or a road, thoroughfare, anybody can drive through that. That's also Vahivat road. I said, I felt very amused. Oh, Vahivat can have that meaning, thoroughfare as well as uh, general transaction. So we are different in that sense. Uh, somebody like me might be very amused and excited knowing the meaning of a certain word. Somebody else recognizes certain raga in music and is excited. So recognizing somehow our nature, that has nothing to do with any prejudice or bias or there is no communal element there, there is no racial element there. If you like Zakir Hussain's tabla or if you like Hariprasa Chaurasya's flute, there is nothing uh, you know, in it about being South Indian or North Indian, Muslim or Buddhist. You like that music, you like this language, etc. So that way, suppose you and I discover certain nature uh, to which we belong, which is free from bias or prejudice, and then if we dis rediscover our originality, be yourself, and everything will fall in place. Then there is less and less pressure and more and more space in the brain. And then there is true happiness. This is what I would say. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you very much, Chidananji. May I request Harsat sir to throw some light on the same topic?
Are you able to hear? Yeah. Yes? Oh, okay. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, very interesting what you say. And I like the title, especially Space in the Brain, because that is what the real space is, uh, real freedom, when there is a space in the brain. What I mean that our brain is generally very, very crowded with many thoughts. And as long as our brain, our mind is crowded, we cannot really enjoy anything, whether it is listening to music or looking at a bird. So the space in the brain is a wonderful thing and probably the purpose of our journey is to have that kind of space. And then everything becomes very enjoyable and uh, it means freedom, freedom from the self. That there's no ambition to achieve anything and living, uh, just watching. And watching not only the things which are outside, but also what is happening because we are not thinking. Thinking is happening to us because we have many memories, experiences, we have learned a language. And so thoughts keep on coming to our brain, whether we like it or not, sometimes good thoughts, sometimes bad thoughts, but there's a possibility of watching it where if we are really curious. And then uh, that curiosity to watch thoughts without trying to change them, it slows down our, our uh, thoughts and there's a space between the thoughts. And uh, probably it may be possible to live more and more in that space and just watching. And then everything looks very beautiful. Creativity may come, as Swamiji talked about, from that space. And uh, happiness, love, beauty, everything is in that space. And um, if we are very busy, not able to observe our own mind clearly, then we are going round and round in the thinking. And in that, there is no freedom, love, beauty, all that. Um, when I got this title before Swamiji gave a talk, and the talk is very beautiful, uh, expressed very, very nicely. But before that, I was thinking that this universe is made up of two things. One is the matter, and like our body is a matter, brain is a matter, and there's a space. And the space is more fundamental than matter because matter exists in the background of space. If you remove matter, space still remains. And so space, that is the outward space. And similarly, there is a space within us, inner space. That is also fundamental. And uh, in the background of that inner space, thoughts come and go. And um, generally, this space, uh, we are not aware of it. But only when due to this inquiry or a curiosity to look inward, and if our mind really stops, then we can feel that there is something else apart from thinking and feeling within us. And that, that thing is called awareness or 
choiceless awareness or space in the brain. So um, everything is related to everything else. Like the word which Swamiji gave, pressure and pleasure, they are related to the brain, the quality of the brain. And um, and it seems that this thing is not matter, pleasure, pressure, space. It is something uh, subjective. We can talk about it, but it is more uh, sensing it. And uh, our senses, like ear, we can listen to very beautiful music. And if there is a space in our brain, with silence, we can really enjoy very good music. And similarly, when we look at a cloud or a bird or a tree or a flower or a human being, when there is a space in our brain, we can see much more clearly everything. And it looks very new, very fresh, as if you are watching a new animal which you have not seen, like a kangaroo jumping. If you are seeing for the first time, you just keep on looking at it. And similarly, when there is a space in the, our brain, then we can even look at animals and birds. And I remember that when I was in the Valley School and once I saw a panther and the panther was looking at me and I was looking at the panther and there was no fear. It was really space to observe. And then it, for a few seconds, and then the panther made some sound and went back and I continued walking in the same direction. And then the thoughts came that I'm going in the same direction in which the panther has gone. So maybe some fear comes through thinking. Otherwise, there is no fear when we really look with a space. So our problems are created in relationship within us, various conflicts, ambition, and all that, it is because there is no space in the brain. When there is a space, we don't compare. Then we feel very happy for what we are. And if some people are doing a very, very good, beautiful work, we can praise them. We don't feel jealous. We don't want to become like that because the real freedom is the freedom from the self, which compares and complicates our life. So I have said enough thing right now. Let other people speak. Thank you. Rajendran, sir, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jain, sir. And thank you, Chedananji, for the wonderful session. Actually, I, I wanted to say something, but uh, uh, our uh, um, Harshad Parikshab actually touched the uh, same thing I wanted to tell uh, about the uh, panther appeal and the way he was working. Actually, there is a self-talk, unceasing noise, chattering that is going on 24 by 7. We are always listening and identifying ourselves to the self-talk and the chattering and the noise. And we react and we do actions. Who is the self? Whose voice is there? Who is talking to whom? It is only when we observe, when we observe ourselves, we will find it is a voice of the thought only speaking. The thought creates a self. And it is speaking to the same self to its own creation. This talk is going on. It is actually most of the time it is negative. It is giving a wrong interpretation. It is telling a story 
and interprets the reality in a totally false way. How, how the interpretation is going on, how the narration is, how the self talk is giving a totally different narrative of the reality, of the what is, how it is interpreting, what is the background of it, whether self talk, self talk is really the true me. Who, who is that? Who is that fellow who is talking? Why we have to? Why we are always identifying ourselves with that self talk? We are listening, and we are acting upon that. We respond to that. We are engaging with that. Always, twenty-four by seven. Negative, always negative, always doubting, always expecting something, uh, uh, some calamity is going to happen. So I just want to take a very briefly, I want to tell two instances that happened in two, three days in, in my life. One is, the morning we go for walking, we go to the railway playground. We found that we have to walk across the over bridge, railway over bridge. And the railway from the railway over bridge and both sides, stairs are le uh, leading down to the uh, various platforms. Whenever we cross the railway over bridge, and uh, we, 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 daily we are going for a morning walk, and we are not buying any platform ticket for that. So whenever we find uh, some uh, ticket checkers uh, standing there in their white uniform, <laughs> the selfies ticket talk. Oh. The, today that man, that man is going to ask uh, where is your uh, platform, where is your ticket like that. So it is giving a new, so and I, when I the, when I go on approaching it, that it creates the tension. So he is going to ask what reply I have to give, whether if I say I am going just to the play, uh, playground just to, at the back side of the junction, whether it, he will believe it like this. So many uh, questions uh, and when I actually crossed it, nothing happened. He just he was busy in doing, uh, he looked at us, but he did not stop us. But, uh, but uh, for a few minutes, I, we were under tension. Then I realized this, uh, uh, why we have to identify with the self-talk, whether it is real, the true, true man is talking. So another instant, we are going for a trekking, uh, uh, starting from tomorrow, tomorrow, the Valley of Flowers in, uh, uh, from uh, Rishikesh. So we are just, uh, we want to buy some trucking shoe. We went to the uh, decathlon shop. We bought it uh, two, two, three weeks back. And I kept it for uh, three days without wearing it. Then I found the same uh, size type of better quality of uh, trucking shoe. I already, I bought a new one. And I did not even uh, from uh, US, but I did not touch it even. Then I found out this. So, okay, well, this, we made a mistake of buying this uh, new shoe. And it, Already I have one, but even I did not even uh, use that uh, that uh, one. I bought it from years. Then I thought, okay, we'll go to the shop and return it. Again, the self-talk started telling, no, they will ask too many questions, whether they will accept it, and uh, whether there is a, whether have you removed the label, and like this, so many uh, negative things was going on. When I, when I walked into the showroom, the sales guy, Without asking any questions, he simply take it and gave me the my review, gave me the money back in cash within two within two minutes. So until this, now, then I realized the self talk is really the culprit who creates a, most of the time who creates the tension. Even Harshad Bhai was telling like that. So the self talk that tells the uh, mm -hmm. the panther was telling like that. Eh? So so uh, the self talk. It's not, it's not giving the, interpreting the reality, the what is in a different way. And it is, it is, it is 100%, it is not at only giving us all the, that is the source of all our tension. That is what I see. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sananjay, would you please like to say something now? Yeah, yeah, surely. I was listening uh, very carefully to both Harshadji and uh, Rajendran. To be frank, many times I don't listen to people so attentively <laughs> after my talk is done that I have to work on it. Sometimes my mind runs with other things. But today with a little effort, you know, <laughs> I was uh, paying attention and loved it. Both of them, uh, in fact, um, Harshadji spoke on how 
it is possible to have certain joy in children, in seeing children playing, in so many people doing their activities. And he also talked about that uh, experience of meeting the panther. And uh, through such real life examples, it was brought out so well how the absence of thought is so blissful Whereas once the thought, that is thought about one's own safety, one's own future, one's own security and so on, that kind of thoughts, once they come, the whole atmosphere changes. Likewise, in Rajendran's uh, submissions also, he especially used the word self-talk. Yes, I fully agree with that. And uh, I am also no exception to uh, uh, people, you know, uh, who get into so much of self-talk. Maybe our domains are different. I don't generally get into a self-talk about, oh, will I make enough money and so on. Money is never a botheration for me. But uh, other things, everybody has their attachments. You know, things like, oh, this evening I have to talk to before this indoor group. I haven't even studied anything. What will I talk? <laughs> and then when it begins... Then there is another problem, where to stop? It just goes on and on because we are so talkative people anyhow. <laughs> so self-talk. I really wish. Ah, I wanted to say during the talk, now I'll share that and pause. Um, one problem all of us have is, like I sometimes wonder, do I think too much? Do I talk too much? Especially when it comes to do I think too much? How do I know? Because I don't know how much Sushil Jain thinks. How many thoughts in uh, five minutes he gets. I don't know how much Pradeep Ji thinks. I don't know how this lay, how much this lady thinks, that child thinks. I only know thoughts rising in me. So in order to know whether I think too much or not really too much, it's very difficult. You know, Whereas, am I taller than Pradeep Bhai? Or am I shorter than Sushil Jain? Uh, do I have the same height as uh, Janardhan Murthy, suppose? That's not very difficult. I can stand uh, next to any of them and say, hey, you are two inches taller than me. <laughs> but how is it possible to know whether I think too much or whether the other person thinks more than I do? This becomes a issue. However, thank God. It's not such a big issue. All we need to do is, are there some irrelevant thoughts? Are there some thoughts which are just a, a fancy? Are there some thoughts which are, what they call, there's an expression in English, snowballing. I have a little fear about something and very soon the little fear grows in size. That's called snowball effect. The snowball apparently, and I don't live in areas where there is snowing in Western countries, that is the expression. So, Harshadji has lived in Canada and US, etc. He would have seen on many occasions a small ball of snow very soon grows bigger and bigger, I, I suppose. So, snowballing is something small becoming very big. So, like that, if our mind has a tiny fear, and very soon it becomes a big fear. Such phenomena, psychological phenomena need to be observed. And we need to gently question the validity, the relevance, whether it's appropriate or am I going tangentially in some direction. So to be aware of the quality of thought, I guess, takes care of the so-called quantity issue. If the quality is maintained, then the quantity should reduce. If we, to use a word which is popular in, in some other context, if I censor my thoughts, you know, by being more aware of quality, of relevance, of being, being rooted in fact, not fancy, I guess a lot of uh, economy of thinking takes place. And to have no thought is perhaps a tall claim for us, very, very hard. But make a small beginning, small beginning, 
moment by moment, let us be aware of thoughts and then perhaps take that silence while watching a panther's. My eyes are seeing the panther's eyes. The panther's eyes are seeing me. You know, that's a terrific <laughs> uh, scenario. I have not under, uh, faced such a scenario, but you want to hear about it, you know, is exciting. Thank you so much. Namaste. What is in the mind of Pradeep ji? He is telling you. Pradeep ji. Mm. Good evening, friends. Uh, another very interesting topic brought by Swamiji. Uh, in one line, if I say, we all have felt pressure sometime or the other. So this is related to space, time, and the content. This is in one line, if you see, that these things are there when we feel anybody feels pressure. Although we are told, we are told by scientists and even JK, that we are using a very small part of our brain. Right? So, and we all agreed to that. Whether this is related to the space or the potential, or maybe both, or the content. You see, available space at a time to us, all of us, may be very limited, may be limited. So after some time, we get, uh, we get tired and we say there is a lot of pressure. So the available time, the available uh, um, space is limited always. Then, and another thing of uh, 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 contributing to pressure is attachment and storage. You see how much we are attached, how much we are attached and accumulate, that is one thing that, that may create ultimately pressure. Then, uh, if it is a question of content, then you see even each cell, whatever recent work on genetic engineering and all that, that DNA, a very small portion is uh, available. A lot of it is redundant DNA. Like so many things are there. Uh, so available av to us, available to us, maybe a very limited space in the sense because, and what could be the solution? Very simple solution JK gave long back, dying to the past. Very clean, simple, unless until we die to the past, there won't be emptiness to receive fresh, fresh, fresh moments of life. So this is, you have to have that freshness and that emptiness whatever you may call it. If that is not there, we'll have pressure. And uh, regarding pleasure also, everybody knows that it comes and goes. It, it comes and goes. It doesn't stay. So that is related to the senses. If all the senses are working simultaneously, that is what he, JK imagined or talked about it. And I imagine that uh, if all the senses are working together, then you can see things with greater clarity. So that is one thing. So regarding pleasure, it comes and goes. We all have experienced that. But regarding this pressure, so one has to think whether I am available or I am. I, I want to become Jnani. I want to. And the more you talk, it shows that the less clarity you have. This is what I think. This is my personal view. This is not derogatory to anyone. So this is what I feel. Till we are satisfied that we have said enough. Till we are, then, then, then only we stop. So otherwise things, if it is clear to you, you will have very few lines to 
tell about your life, about your everything. This is what I feel, friends. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pradeep Ji. Chidanand Ji, I wanted five minutes more from you. Would you please say something? Uh, mic was off, sorry. Uh, okay. Let let me hear one more speaker. Oh, yeah. And then, then I will I will share. Okay. Adil. Yeah. Adil. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so today's topic was also on space. So um, I was just uh, wondering while listening to the other uh, speakers. So, for example, if there is some, uh, suppose as an, I'll take an extreme example. So suppose there is some deep sorrow in the mind. Um, if there is a flowering, if there is some space, if there is some freedom and uh, um, emotion can flower and move, then there is also some relief, you know, what one feels. Uh, because uh, there is no pressure of suppression, there is space for that emotion to come out and flower. It's the same thing like um, when uh, you, you speak from your heart, for example, and uh, someone uh, really deeply listens to you, so you have a sort of a relief also. There is no pressure in that. Um, so there is this question of space then. Um, so so what is pressure then? Um, so generally, like, uh, if, if thought uh, interferes, uh, like if I am thinking about... Uh, something I need to do something I have to do my work and all then there is a sense of pressure it is not like a natural action which comes when I am working but uh, um, there is a pressure put from outside that I need to do something and thought also says that I need to do this and I do it it is thought doing the action it is not like natural uh, you know without conflict that action happens. So uh, that's what I felt uh, was pressure. But this question of what is the space is quite tricky uh, because uh, I don't know, like uh, generally what I feel pressure is also is like there is a sense of uh, division in it. So uh, uh, there is some conflict in pressure. Uh, so there is no this sense of flowering in freedom in it. Of course, uh, to talk about freedom is also very tricky. If I say I can, uh, I'll do what I want to do. Uh, I don't want any, give me my space. That is like um, in the West also, people say that a lot. I need my own space. <laughs> so... Uh, but uh, um, that uh, doing what I want to do uh, is that space. Uh, it's just thought wanting to do something, but is not like a complete answer to life. Maybe it's not a holistic answer. Um, I might like if you have if you have a some sorrow and you just keep on doing things what you want to do, keep your mind occupied. That doesn't give space for that sorrow to come out, right? So it's not that space is unrelated to thought, but then uh, it's quite tricky to talk about it. And uh, yeah, but then the question for me is like, uh, we are living in a world which is based in thought. I have to work and generally, we say we need to use thought to work and then we also feel pressure while doing it. Probably Kapil did not think too much about batting. He just went and played. But uh, that is easy, maybe a little bit easier because that is a physical work. 
and physical work maybe you don't need to use that much thought it is instinctive little bit um, but like for someone who works on the computer or laptop we are constantly using thought all the time so this is a question for me like uh, when is there space and when is there just thought wanting to do something yeah that is a question for me yeah thank you Chidanand ji, would you please say yeah. something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, certainly. certainly. For five minutes. Yeah. For five yeah, minutes. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. In fact, I uh, was uh, drawn to two points that uh, uh, who spoke now? Uh, Adin, sir. Adin, yeah. Adin spoke so clearly and brought out uh, many points, but I, I will address two of the points he raised. Uh, one is he said when. Uh, in his own words, he said, when somebody sort of responds to us, sort of uh, seems to appreciate or understand us, we feel lighter. That was a dimension which uh, uh, I think earlier speakers did not touch upon. I very much respect uh, that view. Many a time we feel uh, our uh, heart or chest gets you know lighter. Somebody in this world where most people have no time to listen to others' difficulties. Somebody listens to us, somebody appreciates us, somebody sympathizes with us, then we feel lighter in the chest as well as in thought level. So interpersonal relationships with more caring probably can generate certain uh, space in the brain too. In fact, it's not exactly a new point. It's the counterpart of what we earlier said. When somebody sort of looks down at us, judges us as a failure or judges us as an unfit, judges, as, uh, judges us as not a good person, uh, we get you know, very uneasy. Somebody, uh, based on facts, not to just praise us or not to just boost our morale with some nice talk, but pointing out certain areas where we are actually good, that means all based on facts, compliments us, we feel a little relaxed. That was one interesting point. And later on, he uh, raised a question about the function of thought. That's a very serious question. Uh, <clears throat> the software professional or those who work long hours on computers and so on. As I have understood this subject, I too may not have fully understood, but uh, uh, as I have understood, whenever we blame thought for creating uh, pressure, creating unhappiness, creating fear, we don't mean functional thoughts at all. Imagine, I'll set, give a simple example, which can be then be extended to computers, laptops, software, everything. Suppose uh, I am going to the airport in Mumbai. My uncle is coming at 11 a.m., and I'm driving towards the airport. I want to pick him up. So to look at my watch and to see that, oh, if he lands at 11 a.m., he comes out at 11.30, but looks like I just will reach around that time. I hope I won't get caught in some traffic jam. So let me take the right road where there is less traffic. These are all functional thoughts. Now, there is a second kind of thought, psychological thought. The psychological thought is, this uncle, last time he came, was such a hard person to handle. For small things, he shouted at me. And he went back unhappy. I don't know how he will behave this time. So, one is first, it seems that my thought is blaming the uncle. But upon scratching the surface, uh, we realize that I am getting worked up at how I will be treated this time. Will my uncle be very good to me, kind to me, appreciative of me, or will he again say things which hurt me, etc. So this concern about the I, my worth, my value, how I am looked at, and so on, that is called the psychological thought. So whether it is a cricketer, uh, going to play or a software engineer, somebody, all of them have two kinds of thoughts. Certain things are how to do the job. 
and certain things are how I may be looked at, how I may be judged and how I would like to be judged, such things. So, uh, we are not spared of this, no matter where we are. Even if somebody goes to the Himalayas, wanting to sit alone by the bank of Ganga and meditate, etc. <laughs> there also he will have a thought, what my relatives in the village from where I came might be thinking about me. I hope they don't talk about me as someone who ran away, who is an escapist. Especially I hope my wife, who permitted me to go away to Himalayas, really appreciates my move. I hope she doesn't talk to other women in the neighborhood that my husband could not handle the responsibilities and therefore he ran away to Himalayas. I hope. Now it is already six months since you came to Himalayas, but still you are thinking of your town, your wife, how your relatives think about you. See, this, these thoughts about how I am going to be looked at, that is a big problem. Whether I will succeed, whether I will fail. Whereas to pay attention, like in the example of going to the airport, Google says this road has more traffic, but the Google is recommending this other road where there is less traffic. Let me take it. That is functional. And after going there, I realized that the flight is half an hour late. I am well in time. And I decide to have a cup of coffee outside and wait for my uncle to come out. I notice certain things. There are a lot of things which we notice, which we learn. You know, those are necessary for being effective, efficient in day-to-day in -day life. Therefore, I think I have tried to throw some light on two kinds of thoughts. One is about uh, functioning in the world, how to operate, how to even psychologically. Suppose uh, one uh, I have a guest who doesn't take coffee at all. I, last time he came, he did not touch the coffee I made. I remember that. It is his personal preferences. So this time I make tea for him because he said I take only tea. So it's not just operating machines or driving a car, but it is certain tastes that people have. Somebody has a taste for music. Somebody has a taste for tea. So I remember those and accordingly, I treat my guest in a better way. By drinking tea, by turning on maybe some Hindustani music, etc. So psychological level also, what are facts? It's a fact that this guest likes tea. It's a fact that this guest doesn't like coffee. And I wanting to be a good host, keep those things in my mind. So such thoughts also are very functional. But there is another thought where uh, what we generally call likes and dislikes prejudice, bias, my, this guest, you know, he's from IIT and these people from IIT have an unnecessary egoism, you see, <laughs> like that, you know, making some sweeping generalization. Uh, people from IIT also, they are both kinds. Some are egoistic, some are not. So, but I, my mind, suppose, makes a sweeping generalization. I think those thoughts are very uh, troublesome. They strengthen the uh, ego or the self in us also, even as we label people in a sweeping generalization. Uh, that, I guess, uh, will be of value to think over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wagmare, you are welcome. Are you able to hear my voice? Yeah, yeah very yeah. well. Okay. So today's topic is very typical and difficult to understand for some. Why I am saying this? Because GK has gone very deep in this. The important word is in this topic is space. Swamiji and Harshad Pariksar has already told about the pressure and pleasure. When mind is too much occupied, there will be pressure. And he, the man will go to find some pleasure. Uh, either drinking or some entertainment or that. So, uh, that is a fine. That is superficial thing. What JK has expressed about space is his own unique way. So, let us uh, see what JK has said. I will try to be a little bit fast because time is less. Uh, when we say or use the word dimension, it is space. 
otherwise there is no dimension is there a difference between the outer space which is limitless and the space in us or there is no space in us at all and we only know the outer space we know the space in us as a center and a circumference the dimension of that center and the radiation from that center is what we generally have and call that space inner space now if there is a center the space must always be limited and therefore we divide the inner space and the outer space so he is clearly talking about the i because we only know this very limited space and we think we would like to reach the other space uh, have in, in a immense space say for example this house exists in space otherwise uh, this could not be uh, there could not be house and the four walls of the room make space and the space in me is the space which the center has created round itself like microphone space exists because of its own space otherwise it could not exist so likewise space either between two thoughts an interval between two thoughts and the space which the center creates around itself and having created that space around itself there is the space outside the limit there is space between thinking a space Uh, around the center, around itself, and the space beyond the barbed wire of the fencing, the boundary. So there is space between two thoughts, and there is space which center creates around itself, which is the space of isolation. So a man with his ego creates uh, all the um, gets all the contents, which further enhances the ego. and he says that this is the space it is cutting itself off when i become important when my ambition with my frustration with my angers with my sexuality with my growth with my hope my reaching nirvana my meditation this is isolation my relation with you is the image of that isolation which is that space so seeing from the image is also a kind of space in between so is it possible to be free of that the center so that the center doesn't create space around itself and build a wall around itself the isolation the prison and uh, call that space can the center uh, cease to be otherwise i can't go beyond it i don't mean i the mind can otherwise i cannot go beyond it i don't mean i the mind cannot go beyond the limitation unless center goes now what is that center the center is the me and the not me that center is the observer the thinker the experiencer and in that center is also the observed the center says that that is the barbed wire i have created around myself since the center is limited it separate itself from the barbed wire fence so that becomes the observed the cent the center is observer so there is a space between the observer and the observed that space it tries to bridge over it says that must be changed that must not be uh, this is narrow this is wide i must be better than that that is the movement between the space between the observer and the observed and hence conflict between the observer and observed now can the center be still or fade away or lie very quiet or can be completely absorbed dissolved or lie as a vague fragment in the distance when the center is not in operation then there is a vast space when center is not in the operation there is a vast space now this center is content of consciousness there is no consciousness if uh, there is no content without content where is consciousness and that is the space if the mind is empty of content then there is something else that will operate this is very interesting 
if the mind is empty of content then there is something else will operate which will use this which will function within the field of the known so space between two thoughts obviously between the two factors of time two periods of time because thought is also the time now im now image talks about love but the love of the image is not love so can consciousness empty itself of content love is not pleasure sex and all the rest of it the love the unknown this is very interesting the love the unknown and the known which is content of consciousness the two must be in harmony love with content is pleasure sexual ambitions etc to move between unknown and known is intelligence to move between unknown and known is intelligence so the mind can empty itself by not making image now how this content of consciousness can be tackled for that he says so the mind can can empty itself by not making image now for that his statements are space means silence inwardly this also he says freedom is space pressure exists on the brain when there is no space when mind has vast space in that space there is energy this is also interesting so if we uh, broadly see this he has uh, attacked on uh, in a way on ego and creations of ego if we com uh, compare this with tradition this is also interesting in tradition also they say stool akash sushma akash and chida akash etc this stool sushma akash means which hides the unmanifest akash should be there or a boundary should be there or a curtain should be there to manifest something and also uh, also you have, there is a chid akash chid akash means which which is having energy which is the energy base so krishna murti if we see uh, there is a similarity in between the statements in tradition also one has to uh have access to this chid akash and energy and similarly here also <coughs> if you see then the this space how can you get the vast space by just uh, by only by the uh, your ego dilution of the ego similarly in the tradition also uh, they say that unless the ego is there there will be no uh, freedom to you or uh, there will be no access to that energy so i want to say today this much only thank you thank you very much vagmare for completing so yes actually yes. actually nobody has uh, take this depth of faith so i try to take this uh, okay okay yes. sir you have deceived us by saying not coming and now you have come So say whatever you wanted to say. We take it as a prasad. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I could not uh, listen no. properly. That is addressed to me, I think. <laughs> Personal address to Prasad ji. Oh. Sir, he he won't come, but he came. So I said, then deliver the prasad. <clears throat> Sir, by saying oh. I won't come, I have missed the main speaker's <laughs> talk. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I have heard Harsha ji ah. and also other speakers. Uh, sir, uh, firstly, I want to say this is space in the mind. This is a contribution of Krishna ji. In the sense. the our tradition has placed a stress on effort you make 
you do tapas or you do chanting, you do pujas, you do this, you do that. And so many things you do. And then you achieve some mocha or whatever. But this simple space in the brain where effort has no importance. I think that is a significant, singular contribution of Krishnaji. And so many speakers have made so many good points. But first, Harshaji has said there is a great distinction. There is a space inside, there is space outside. Yes, there is space inside and space outside. Space outside is very much there. But what we are worried about is a space inside. Space inside is very narrow for all of us. There is no wide space inside us. Because of so many reasons. Like Mr. Radin has said, work. It can be uh, software or any other work or responsibilities, family responsibilities. There are so many family responsibilities. All these things, some of us are happily placed in the sense that we don't have to worry about our three square meals per day. But a lot of people have to worry on that front. One thing that ties us down to this world is, as somebody said, it is attachment. I was listening to some video of Joe Biden and uh, Trump. You see, at this age, also, people are attached to power and to money. Biden's job is not in a very healthy position, but still he is contesting. He doesn't want to get out of that contest. If you have that type of attitude towards life, how will you have space in the mind? You can't have space in the mind with that type of attachment to temporal power. Maybe he may think that he is going to do great service to the nation. So he is sacrificing his, his own health and comfort and all that for the nation. But then, Everybody thinks like that. Every politician thinks like that, that he is doing great service. And then somebody else has made a point. You have to die to the past. Unless you die to the past, you can't live in the present. I have really labored a lot on this point. Because on one side, we have our memories, your loyalties to your parents, etc., etc., your friends, your deceased friends. You have Hello. those loyalties. And at the same time, they represent the past. So, how do you reconcile? Ultimately, I thought it cannot be that you forget your deceased friends or 
your parents and your other ancestors and neighbors. But that you see to it that they don't hold a they don't have a hold on you or you realize what is happening that you are living in the past to that extent. So that is my reconciliation of the two. And then pleasure. I think some, somebody, I think uh, Harshadji, not Harshadji, Pradeepji has made this point that pleasure is so transient. It is of the moment, for the moment, and it's over, and it leaves a hangover, generally. Actually, there is a poem by Keats in which he says, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy hath her shrine. In the temple of delight, melancholy, that is sadness, has her sovereign shrine, has her shrine. It only means the what we are talking about, that, that there is a hangover after their bout of liquor. You cannot avoid it. A prayer, such a pleasure, there is some uh, relapse. So, then, we in India particularly have to remember that ours is a very ancient civilization. There is a lot of rubbish that has accumulated. There may be some nuggets of gold somewhere, but the rubbish that has accumulated is so much. You need a big broomstick like Krishnaji to sweep away all that dust and rubbish. And then, I'm sorry, sir, if I'm taking too much time. If you give me time, I will proceed. Otherwise, I will try to close it. Sushilji. Sir, may I ask Harsad Parik to end it? Because it is already 7.33, sir. Uh, yeah. <coughs> one minute, sir, one minute. I, I am okay. going to close it. Okay. One, ultimately, ultimately. You have to decide. You have to decide. Uh, I, will, I, I will close it. I will close it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dinesh Ji has made a great point. That is, we have barbed wires around us and the barbed wire is our ego. Yes, it is that ego that gives us a lot of suffering, a lot of stuffed head, and we are kept away from that quietness. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Arthur, sir, please end it by saying uh, one yes. I Just one minute. Uh, about the space in the brain, what Kabir had said. Kabir had said, Had had par sab koi gaye, behad gaya na koi. Behad ke maidan mein ramay kabira soi. It means that everybody has gone up to the boundary. Nobody has gone beyond the boundary, boundary of the mind. And kabir plays beyond in the beyond the boundary of the mind. So even in the tradition, People have gone very, very, very deep into freedom, real freedom. Only that Krishnaji is able to explain in our own language, uh, make it simple for us to understand. But as far as the actual experience of freedom, 
it exists all the time. Many, many mistakes have expressed in their own ways. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.